All right. Thank you. Okay, guys, let's sit down. All righty. Uh, thank you so much. Wow. I enjoyed this morning Larry's message. And he brought out, he brought out something that I had never, ever seen before when he talked about John the Baptist. I mean, he talked about Herod extinguished the voice of repentance in his life. That was, gr- that was good, brother. That was good. Very good. And uh, we've got to keep hearing that voice, haven't we? We've got to keep hearing that voice. Don't cut that voice out of your life. It was good. Tonight uh, is a first for me, and uh, I've never tag team preached. I've let some others in here do it, and that went over real good. We're going to let some ladies do it. No, I've never tag team preached. No, no, no. This is first for me. And so I'm going to have to really pull the reins in, you know, for, for my time. But uh, come on up here, Larry. Amen. And so we're going to, we're going to do this together. Now, I signed a topic uh, so that we could both kind of at least be in the same ballpark. And uh, the topic was our identity in Christ. And this is going to go along with his testimony that you're going to hear tonight. So I'm going to let Brother Larry go first. And then I'm going to come up, and then he may even come back a second time. Y'all cool with that? Are, are y'all here? Okay. No, 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 not every few minutes. Uh, so, brother, welcome. <laughs> She'll fall slap out. She'll fall out. She'll fall out. Amen. Y'all welcome, brother Larry Vinson. Amen. That's right. Is this thing on? All right. One very important announcement they forgot for the month of April is April 12th. It is my birthday, but I will not accept checks mailed to 1806 Reynolds Road, Perigold, Arkansas, 72472. I'll have to pray about it. So, um, student loans are coming up, so I'm going to let the Lord take that. Uh, I love what I felt this morning. Um, Uncle Rick, I don't mean to step over any boundaries, but I just want to share with you, I am of a different type of Pentecostal faith. I'm a apostolic, UPC, and we're different. But you guys made us feel, or have made us feel all weekend, so, well, we're family anyway by blood, but this morning, I was worried, I'm not going to lie to you, because I've never preached outside of my comfort zone. Um, that's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. Lord, forgive me. I'm already lying again. <laughs> uh, Ken, Ken preached here, didn't he? Yes. Our co- he's my second cousin. I don't know that once removed. Cousin. And Angela tried to explain all that to me earlier. I don't get it. But he's my real second cousin, I guess. But uh, I did preach and teach for him a couple times when I was trying to get my license. And uh, you guys just did a great job of making us feel welcome. We love the worship. Absolutely. Ours is so similar. But I, I was worried about that kind of stuff because when you're walking into something that you don't know, you kind of worry. I mean, I do. Y'all might not. I don't know. But like I said, I'm made out of spit and mud, and God's still working on me. So, um, so tonight's topic is who we are in Christ. So now this is how I had planned my part to go. Um, and if Uncle Ricky has any objections, of course, he's the pastor of the church. I defer to him. And what I want to do is I would like to tell you what we are, who we are, what we should be in Christ. And then I was going to let him speak, and then I want to come back and share my testimony, and then I'm going to tell you the how I really feel like we should be in Christ. Does that make sense a little bit, maybe, clear as mud? Okay, um, the reason I want to do that is because sharing my testimony takes me a, I got to get comfortable first. I've got to get in my comfort zone. So um, I've been in some dark places. I don't know anybody here, aside from my family, but uh, I've been in some dark places. And it takes me a little bit to, to kind of warm up to that, so that's what I intend to do. Again, I want to give honor where honor is due. Uh, Uncle Rick, Pastor Rick. Thank you so much for having us. We love you guys greatly. I hope this is the beginning of a beautiful something in our family that 
Um, when, when my grandmother, his mother died, our family kind of went separate ways. I know he wouldn't care for me sharing this. He's probably already told you. Um, I don't get to see my aunts and uncles very much. Now, Uncle Ricky and Aunt Angela, they've always lived off. And then my dad was in the Air Force as well, and, and we lived off in a, a few different places. And uh, we talked this weekend about vacations we had had where they would come see us or we would come see them. And, you know, I wish it was like that all the time. I do. I wish it, I wish, I wish we did. And I, I love y'all's family. I told Melanie, you know, Melanie and I, this is one thing you guys can pray for us about. I don't mean to embarrass my wife, although I will just by saying something silly. But we are trying to have a child. Now, with God, all things are possible. Now, I know, I know when I tell you this, you're going to say, that's nothing. But, you know, she believes everything she reads on the Google. So, I'm 39. I'll be 39 April 12th, 1806 Reynolds Road, Perigold, Arkansas. <laughs> and she'll be 35, 35 April the 2nd, same address. And, uh... <laughs> She, you know, the, if, you, if you read the Google or WebMD, which don't ever read WebMD because it will convince you that you have beard cancer, but, and I don't have a beard, so anyway, you put in your symptoms and it's like beard cancer. So anyway, um, you know, we're trying to have a child, and I had the faith, and she does too, that we will conceive. We want a child more than anything. She's wanted to be a mother her whole life, and I believe that God will grant that. So in God, we will be parents. That's one, of our, that's one of my things. In God, we will be parents. Uh, he knows what he's doing. He knows what he needs to bring us through. You know, you can never say I've been tempted of God because God doesn't work that way. Uh, I learned that lesson from my Uncle Ricky. When my mother passed away, I was backslidden. And I'm telling y'all guys, y'all are in for a ride when I tell you my story. I was backslidden. And I remember running out of that hospital room because they told me my mother was not going to live. And I was crying and bawling and swallowing. And my Uncle Ricky, he ran down three flights of stairs or probably took the elevator, I don't know. But he, uh, he met me at my car and I was bawling. I mean, a 30, you know, 32, 33-year-old grown man sitting here bawling and swallowing. I said, Uncle Ricky, I said, I backslid on God. I let him down and now he's taking my mom. And he's like, no, 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 no. He said, God does not work on like that. And, you know, but now he does allow things. To, to happen, but it was my mom's time to go, and I've had to come to peace with that. But it wasn't because I was sinning or anything like that. Um, although that guilt took a long time for me to get rid of, even after I got Harpo the puppy, which, by the way, if y'all are not Facebook friends with me, you have to meet Harpo. It's on Brother Rick and, and Angela's Facebook page. He's my puppy. I should have named him Judas because when I got married, he became a uh, Melanie's dog. So anyway, I am going somewhere, I promise. I'm just trying to get comfortable. We have water again. <laughs> I know you do. I know you do. I know you do. I say all that to say y'all have been wonderful to us this weekend, and we just appreciate y'all making our first time out of our comfort zone a great time. And uh, I've, I've just enjoyed it greatly, and so has my wife. The worship here is just beautiful. Paul, the songs you've written, the songs you play, Ashley, I had no idea you could sing like that. I knew you could sing, but I knew you, I had no idea you could sing like that. And it's just anointed. It's beautiful. And we've just loved getting to know uh, Brother Allen. And uh, I'm assuming you're all brothers. I don't think you could tell me any different. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, I want to talk to you. Have, you, have any of y'all ever heard of Evan, Evan Roberts? Okay. The Great Revivalist in Wales, right? Well, about for about almost a year, my church has, my pastor started studying what went on in Wales, you know. So, I mean, he had studied it before, of course, but he's like, what really happened? You know, because in Wales, there were a million people filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's where barbershop quartets were invented because the police officers, they, they didn't have any crime. There was no crime, so they had to do something. So they started singing and all that. Well, what had happened was um, one night, uh, Evan Roberts got the opportunity to speak after the sermon. The pastor told him, if there's anyone left, you can speak. 
And now this is just my understanding of the story. If it's not true, I blame my pastor. But anyway, um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, blame the Google. But here's something I want to leave with y'all this weekend that we've been doing for four almost a year, and it has break, brought great results. It's kind of like a saying, and Evan Roberts himself said, if you will do these five things, he said, then you will have a revival. You will have a, more, a million soul revival. And then the first one says, I will rid myself of all sin. The second one says, I will separate myself from questionable things. Does anyone in here have questionable things in their life? I'm raising my hand right here, so you don't have to be embarrassed. I will listen always to the Holy Ghost. I will proclaim Jesus everywhere to everyone, which we're supposed to do anywhere, anyway. And then the fifth one is, if you do all four of those things, I will have revival. And that's how the, that Wales revival came about. And I just wanted to share that with y'all, just as a little nugget. So, all right. It is, I will separate my sin from all, I will separate myself from all sin. I will separate myself from questionable things. I will listen always to the Holy Ghost. I will proclaim Jesus everywhere to everybody, and I will have revival. Which, to me, if you separate yourself from questionable things, you covered all the rest of them pretty much anyway. So, but, again, that's just something I wanted to leave with you guys. So, um, again, I give honor to your pastor, pastor's wife, family. I give honor to my pastor for allowing me us to make this trip. Um, all the people involved, this, the hee hall dinner was great. Everybody who, who had their part in that and the kids were just fantastic this way I was cracking up the whole time and uh, just the sweet spirit of this church and the members that I can tell and I'm just so so glad that we got to come so what we are in Christ is our topic or our identity in Christ so I'm going to take for my main scripture in the King James Version I, I was teasing him earlier. I didn't even know this morning I was reading the New King James, I guess, because I, I knew it. And I, they said I was correcting it, and I didn't even notice it. But anyway, it's, uh, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lay in wait to deceive. We'll stop there. Brother uh, Ricky, will you ask the blessing over the word? Amen, in Jesus' name. There are those who are laying in wait to deceive you. And there are those who are wanting you to be confused. In today's world... It's mass chaos and confusion. In such a world, a person can be pulled in many directions. You have someone telling you one thing, and then two minutes later, they've changed their mind or decided that something else was right. You have, uh, you have to discern the direction in which you're going. You have to have your discerner on at all times because there are people who are laying in wait, and they may not even know it. They may. They may not. I don't know how all that works. I don't know if Judas knew what he was doing, whatever, but he did it. But anyway... Uh, you got to have your discerner on telling you which way you should go. In this world of confusion, the church is not subject, or we're not exempt, exempt from that. It talks about being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. How many of you, I've heard it uh, mentioned a couple of times today, I, I believe I even heard Brother Paul talk about tossed to and fro. And then we talked about a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So the world, the devil, he wants you to to doubt everything. He wants you to just, hey, this sounds right, this sounds right, I'm going to follow this preacher. You know, we can barely get people to our churches. I, I, this is no reflection of this church. This is a general statement. We can barely get people to our churches, but if you let somebody come by who has a healing ministry or a prophetic ministry or they're an apostle or something, man, they're packed out. I mean, you got people paying their tithes to these people, and that's wrong. Your ties go to the local church. That's for you, charge, Uncle Rick. <laughs> but um, and I'm a firm believer in ties and offerings. God will uh, bless you for that. Um, it is 
he doesn't need your money. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It's about your obedience. So, um, but there are men who want you to be tossed to and fro. They don't want you. They know that if you really get a hold of the heart of God, and you can do that because God said, "Who was a, David was a man after His own heart." So it is possible. It is possible. If it wasn't, he wouldn't have put the story in David, of David in there. It's possible that the Red Sea could part again. He said that we would do greater miracles than what he did. So I believe that stuff, we just we have to have the faith for it. You know, we have to lay the foundation. So I say that, and I'm going somewhere, I promise. So I want to talk to you about your Christian identity in Christ. Uh, a Christian is someone who follows the instructions given in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You have to do that. There are so many different teachings, so many different, I mean, just things that have just blown my mind. I'm like, what in the world? I just found out that my father, uh, one of his older brothers, uh, they were all raised in church, Pentecostal church, uh, Assembly of God, uh, for a little while, they went to United Pentecostal Church, and then, but, but, but for the most part, it was Assembly of God. And I thought, my dad is 70 years old. So out of his 70 years in life, he has had to have made a profession of faith at some point in time. Not. Didn't. Never. Not one time. To our knowledge. He won't talk about it if he didn't. Now, the reason I bring that up is because he was deceived. Um, there were these, this is a story Ken who came and preached for you guys not too long ago. He told me, he, uh, he had a, a friend, his name was Ewan, Ewan Baker, and he was one of my dad's good friends, my dad and our oldest, his oldest brother, Jerry. And there was this band of traveling preachers, they call them charlatans, charlatans I guess they're just after money or whatever. So, uh, he, uh. Ewan went to this revival and made a profession of faith. He got up and, and gave his heart to the Lord. He repented. And uh, he let that voice of repentance ring in his ears. Well, during the course of that service, there were miracle signs and wonders that went forth. A lady came up out of a wheelchair running. You know, there was one, people threw away crutches. People threw away canes, uh, supposedly, and all this. Well, that was all good and well. And... I don't know. My dad's never told me this. That might have impressed my dad. Now, he had been around Pentecost his whole life, so I'm sure he wasn't, you know, that wasn't something that he had, uh, it didn't scare him. So, but then, a few months later, this UN guy went to Indiana, and the same people were there. And so he's like, I'm going to, you know, I'm, and he got his family to go. Well, guess what? He got there. The same woman was healed out of the wheelchair. The same people who were deaf were now they could hear and all that. Well, that really disheartened them, and that story got back to my dad. And so I, I, I rebuke that in Jesus' name. I, I, I believe my dad will come into the church. He's, he's 70. He's in bad health. I covet y'all's prayers for him. He's just in a bad way since my mother passed away. And uh, part of our identity in Christ is to pray for others and to be witnesses to others. That's why he gives us the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 1 and 8. He said, you know, so that you'll be witnesses. So I know that he's he's going to come into this. I know that he is. So let me get back to my notes before I get too off topic. Um, study to show yourself approved. Because that way you won't fall by the way of the charlatans. You know, that stuff still happens today. It, it's very real. It's I've had some people tell me some just crazy stuff. And I'm like... I'm going to have to get my discerner out on that one. So, you know, because that just don't make sense, you know, when it's not in the water. And they're like, oh, well, it, it, you kind of have to stretch this a little bit. You know, I'm like, no, there's no stretching in the Bible. It's, it, it's very sick. So, um, our, identity, our identity in Christ is part of it. We have to follow peace with all men and holiness, without which none will see the Lord. How many of you find that hard? But a lot of times we are guilty of the holiness part, you know. But to me, the following peace with all men, man, I think me and Brother Paul, I think we're kindred spirits. I can feel it. We, we both have those same struggles. But I, um, we have to follow peace with all men. We have to be people of forgiveness. 
You know, we have to be people. If someone comes to you, if they've hurt you, you have to forgive them. Jesus didn't give you an option about it. He said, if you hate your brother, who you do see, how can you love me? Of course, is a paraphrase. Who you haven't seen. So, um, you know, we have to be people of forgiveness. And that can be very hard, and it can also be very hard to forgive yourself. And this is, in a minute, I'm going to tell you my testimony, and, and you're going to see some of, some of that um, come into play. Um, our di- identity, you have to be authentic. That's part of our, our identity. Our identity in Christ is racism, I'm sorry. Um, you have to be authentic. You have to be real. People are looking for you to fall. Your life, when you tell them that you're a Christian, that you're a follower of Christ, your life is under a microscope. So you have to be okay with that. If you're not okay with that, you have to find an altar and become okay with it. Because they're just looking. They're looking for you to mess up. They really are. They are looking to call you a hypocrite. They are wanting to call you on the carpet. You know, and and while I'm on that... One of the things that I, that irritates just it just irritates me. I believe in the gifts of the Holy Ghost just as much as the next person. But if I'm going to sit here and give you a word that I say is from the Lord and it's bad, I'm not going to have a microphone in my mouth to do it because I don't need to air your dirty laundry out to everybody else, and that is not edifying to anybody. So if the Lord ever gives you a word, make sure it's edifying. And make sure you present it in a way that is edifying. I mean, have any of y'all been in services where someone just read? I mean, just, I've heard them say, you're nothing but a dog, and you're not saved. I mean, seriously, you're not saved. How are you going to tell somebody else they ain't saved? When did Jesus start hiring, and how much does he pay? That's what I want to say, because I, I, I need that job. Then I won't have to worry about those student loans. But, um uh, you know, as a Christian, we just have to be loving and we have to be forgiving and we have to, we have to get past all of our hang-ups about, you know, um, different things. For instance, I, I'm not embarrassing my wife here, but we have convictions that are our convictions. You know, there are things that we have consecrated ourselves to God about, okay? And one of the things that just, um, I'm on a, a minister's forum on Facebook which is, you know, Facebook, guys. I gotta, I, it's addicting, you know. You can't, you can't down it when you're on it. But it's supposed to be, a, uh, we're apostolic. It's supposed to be apostolic uh, for ministers. And it's supposed to be uplifting and all this. We have some detractors, you know, and they don't, they don't necessarily believe the way we do about the consecrations, the personal sacrifices that me and my, my, my wife make. And that just really gets under my skin because I, if you don't believe that, that's fine. But don't make fun of us because we're trying to do things that we believe make us closer Amen. to God. Amen. You know, I mean, and and that just really, when Christians tear down Christians, it just makes me want to just, Amen. I just got to pray. <laughs> I just got to pray. I got to repent and let that voice of repentance be in my head. But our identity in Christ we are overcomers. We are, you know, and, and all this is, you're going to see how this comes into play in my life in just a little bit. But we are, um, uh, we are, we've got to be authentic. We've got to be real. We've got to study to show ourselves approved. We've got to be steadfast. We have to be people of the name. If you say that you're a Christian and that you are, and, and you know, you have to take that, that seriously because in today's world, People are, are just waiting to eat you up. They're just, they're waiting. You know, we got, we're, we're not fighting big things like ISIS. Yes, I know that they're there and I know we are, but we're fighting people in these very neighborhoods. You know, those are the people that we're fighting the most. And, and what makes it harder is that we're trying to win them, but they think that we're hypocrites or they think that we're crazy because we speak in tongues. And, and that's another thing, uh, rightly dividing the word of truth. You better always be a, able to give an account of why the reason of your hope and calling. You, if you believe in speaking in tongues, and I know this church does, you better know why. Because yeah, there, you are going to get someone from another denomination, and they may be genuinely interested. They may not be trying to bring you down. Now, there's some that try to bring you down. Believe me, I've been there and done that. could probably write a book, look for it next week. 
or next year. But there are some who genuinely want to know our beliefs and, and why we believe that with the baptism of the Holy Ghost comes the evidence of speaking in other tongues. I have my own personal beliefs about that. I think if, the, if God can tame your tongue, which is the most unruly part of your body, the rest should be gravy. But that ain't always the case. But, but uh, you know, you just got to always be ready to give an account. You've got to know who you are in Christ. Amen. So tonight, if you don't know who you are in Christ, I promise you, you can come to this altar and you can figure it out. And I'll stay here and I'll help you figure it out. I know my Uncle Ricky will. And uh, you just be sure. You just stand strong. You just be who you are. You be vigilant in what you do. You study to show yourself approved. You stay on your knees in prayer and you claim, you know, if you have unsaved loved ones, then you just keep calling their names out before the Lord. If you're tired, you keep on uh, pressing towards that Holy Ghost peace that he'll give you. And boy, he will. And when it hits you, you'll just be. So, I mean, he can give you that rest, you know. And you just, you have to be sure of your apostolic identity. I'm going to get out of the way for Uncle Ricky right now. And then hopefully I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my struggles and how God has showed himself to be faithful and, well, I'm going to tell you why I'm his favorite. So. Amen. Thank you, Larry. I'm not going to take very much time because I want him to have plenty of time to share his testimony. But there's something I want to, I want to look at tonight in our identity and how we come to know who we are in Christ. And uh, I want you to look, if you would, in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 19. Robbie's going to put them up on the screen, as he already, already has. And I want you to follow along with me. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, Jesus was asking a question. Who do men say that I am? Okay. Who do men say that you are? This is kind of what you were talking about a little bit. Who do men say that you are? Then they answered. The disciples said, Well, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Notice that they all had a different identity of who Jesus was. Different answers. But then Jesus, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? As he looked at his disciples. I don't want to know what the world is saying. That doesn't matter. I want to know who do you say that I am? Fellow believers, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Wow. He hit it on the, he hit it on the head, didn't he? He hit it exactly as to who Jesus was and is. And this is what Jesus said. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I want, you need to, if you underline in your Bible, that's where you need to underline. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You will never know who you are in Christ until the Holy Spirit reveals himself to you. And then when the Holy Spirit reveals Himself to you and tells you who you are and it becomes a revelation to you, the world will never be able to describe you. Your family will never be able to tell you, no, that's not who you are, you're this. That's not who you are. You're, you're, you're not a Christian, you're a Vincent. Well, yeah, I'm a Vincent on this earth, but first I'm a Christian. Okay? That's who I am. Flesh and blood doesn't reveal who you are. Flesh and blood doesn't give you your identity. Flesh and blood doesn't identify you. It is the Spirit of the living God that's in you that identifies who you are tonight. Your work doesn't identify you. Your family doesn't identify you. Your status in life, whether you're rich or poor or indifferent or drive a fancy car or don't drive one at all. That does not identify you. That's not who you are. But see, flesh and blood, wants to, they want to put all these labels on us and say, well, you're this. Well, you go to the RCF down there. That's, that, that, that's a Holy Spirit-filled church. Yep. Make no bones about it. Don't mind a bit. 
Okay? Or, or you go to, you're, you're, you're this kind of person, that kind of person. And now in, in our time, in, in our area, you know, the, the, the most popular place to go to church in our area is, is Church of the Highlands. It's a good church. But everybody, that I, everybody and their brother, I was talking to a guy today that, that uh, uh, his, his family, they, they were involved in a, in a local church and working and working and doing and, and just really. But all of a sudden now they're going to Church of the Highlands because all they have to do is go. Don't get me on that. And then we find this is important. And Jesus said, and I also say to you that you are Peter. Now notice, he asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter was able to say, thou art the Christ. And now Jesus is going to reveal to Peter who he is. Now he's going to reveal to Peter who he is. When you get the revelation of who Jesus is. Now it's your turn. He's going to reveal to you who you are. Until you get that revelation, you will never be who God called you to be in His kingdom. Until you get the revelation of who you are in Jesus, you will never be who God called you to be in His kingdom. Peter, to this point, was just Peter. Now, did he make mistakes after this? You know he did. But he says, now I say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, and if you're looking for gestures, most likely Jesus at this point gestured to himself, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. But then something very important happens after this. Jesus was saying, now the Catholic church got this all wrong. They were thinking that, that at this point that, that Jesus was telling Peter that he was going to build his church on him. And at this point, Jesus, or Peter became the very first pope. Well, you've got to read a whole lot into that to come to that conclusion, okay? You really do. You've got to add a whole lot. So we find that then, then Jesus says this in the next verse. He says, and I will give you. Now who's he talking to? Who's he talking to? He's talking to Peter, right? Now he's talking to Peter. Now, see, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But I'm going to give you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, you think about that for a minute. Once Jesus told Peter who he was, now God, Jesus, could now trust Peter with his authority. He can now give him his authority. But when you're running around in church, and you're a Christian, you, you, you're saved and, and all that, you know, and you love Jesus, but you still don't know who you are, Jesus can't bestow that authority on you yet because, you see, that's like taking a six-year-old child. Who in here is six? Or right around there? Ethan. Can you imagine? Ethan, raise your hand there. Come here a minute, Ethan. Come here. Come here. Come here. I, was, I would have called Jaden, but he's asleep. He's wore out. He's wore out. He's back like he's teenagers over here. They're just so wore out. No, y'all, we need to pray for these guys. They're just so wore out. I'm telling you. Come here, Ethan. Come here. Right here. I do. Ethan, turn around here. I'm trying to get you dizzy. How many of y'all would like to hand Ethan a loaded... 357 Magnum. That would be a gun. A loaded gun. Now, you know why? Because Ethan doesn't yet know the authority of that gun. That's exactly... Oh, you do? See, that's like a, that's like a whole bunch of Christians I know. When you... If God turned His authority over to people who don't know who they are and what authority they have, it would be like turn, giving a gun to a six-year-old and turning him loose. Seven. Sorry. Seven. Do you understand that? So at this point, up until this point, Jesus could not give Peter that authority. But because Peter received a revelation... Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father which is in heaven 
has shown this to you. He got a revelation of who Jesus was. And now through the revelation of who Jesus was, Jesus gives him a revelation of who he is. And now because he knows who he is, Jesus said, now I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. I'm going to give you all authority. And whatsoever you bind in heaven, we bound on earth. And whatsoever you loose on earth, we loose in heaven. So on and so forth. And so we find here tonight that if you learn who you are in Jesus Christ, when that revelation comes, this is not a flesh and blood thing. No preacher can tell you you're called to preach. No preacher can tell you you're a prophet. No preacher can tell you you're an apostle. No preacher can tell you, well, you're an evangelist. That's not their job. That becomes through revelation, through your study, as he was speaking about, through your study of the Scripture, getting down into the nitty-gritty, getting in the altar, and getting a revelation of who Jesus is. So I've got to ask you tonight, Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Is he just the babe in the manger? Is he the man hanging on the cross? Is he the one who rose from the dead? Is he someone that you've heard about, talked about, and uh, I kind of believe him. You've got to get the revelation of who he is. He is the son of the living God who went to the cross who died for my sin who became the supreme sacrifice for all of my sin who rose on the third day and 40 days 50 40 days later ascended into heaven and now sits at the right hand of God the Father and has made all of his enemies his footstool when that revelation not just reading about it Not just reading about it, but when it becomes a revelation in your spirit, and now you know that you know that you know that you know, and nobody can tell you any different. Because you will be challenged, just as as Larry was saying. So we find here that, that Jesus had an identity problem. Now, Jesus knew who he was, but men didn't know who he was. He had an identity problem, not with himself. The world didn't know who he was, but they needed to. His own disciples didn't know who he was, but they needed to. The revelation that Peter had catapulted Peter into a new position in Jesus. How many of you need to find yourself in a new place in Jesus? Another level. Anybody in here want to go to another level in Jesus Christ? Get that revelation of who he is, and he'll reveal to you who you are. See, in a minute, when, when Larry gives his testimony, God's going to tell him, you'll hear it, this is who you are. That's, that's not who you are. When you're over here living like this, that's not who you are. This is who you are. When you see him in this pulpit preaching, that's who you are. Not that other. Okay, not that other. Jesus tells Peter who he is. You're Peter. And I give you this authority. So in my part tonight, in closing... You need a revelation of Jesus. You say, but I'm a Christian. I understand that. But I have to have that revelation of Jesus on a constant basis. You see, because Peter found himself actually denying Jesus. Even after this, okay? Even after this. And he even went back to his old habits of fishing. But because of that seed that was planted in him, when he saw Jesus cooking on the seashore, he ran to him. And that's when Jesus said, Peter... Do you love me more than these? Three times he asked him. Each time he said, feed my lambs, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And finally, Peter got the revelation again of who Jesus is, the Son of the living God. So my challenge to you tonight is to get in the altar. Get in your prayer closet. Get along with Jesus. Find out who he is. And then let him tell you who you are. Amen. There you go. All right, so everybody in here has their own struggles, okay?
right? And while I share my story with you, I'm, I'm never, it's never my intention to make mine greater than yours. I don't have that mentality. I just want to share what God brought me through to encourage you, to help you find who you are in Christ, and to know that you can overcome anything. Now, I don't know if Uncle Rick or Aunt Angela has ever talked to you a little bit about me. There were many years when I was out on God, and I would call them for prayer or text them or email, usually because I knew that he couldn't preach at me through email. (laughs) But, um, so I don't know. I don't know what he told you. But I will tell you this. Um, I'm going to trip if I don't get up here. Um, God delivered me out of homosexuality. And now I'm married to my beautiful wife, who I love with all of my heart. And we have a ministry that is growing. Like I said, I'm still new to this, so if I still act nervous or crazy or get tongue-tied and lost, and I'm human. But I will tell you that if you hold on, I'm going to backtrack. Okay, so the first time, my mother raised me in a church. And, um, and I don't want to offend anyone, but it was a church of God. Church of God of prophecy, to be exact. Um, my Uncle Ricky, I don't, has Brother Jerry ever been here? Oh, okay. Well, anyway, he's a minister as well. Uh, we, I come from a long line of, of ministers. Um, and we started going to church there. Well, um, I was young and didn't really, it it was a small church and they wanted me to be involved with the youth group and stuff like that, but I just didn't, I didn't want to be there. Um, my dad wasn't going, not that I was a daddy's boy, I was a mama's boy. Um, I'll admit that. Um, until her, her last passing breath, I was a mama's boy. Um, I, I was close to my dad. Me and my dad had a good relationship for the most part. Um, but I thought, he doesn't have to go. Why do I have to go? You know, they're playing this old music on this piano. I don't even know what they're talking about. You know, I, I knew about God. But um, anyway, so I had never heard that homosexuality was wrong. And I knew that I had these feelings. Now, at this point, I was young, very young, never uh, having acted on them or anything like that. I was telling my wife on the way up here, and she was surprised about this, but the first time I ever heard that homosexuality was wrong was not from a minister. It was not from anyone in the church. It was from Oprah Winfrey. And I remember going home that day. We had uh, Channel One. Does anyone remember Channel One? Okay, it was the news thing, uh, you know, in the school, and they had the little thing. Well, at the end of that, they would sometimes let us watch, you know, the Oprah Winfrey show, which is (laughs) probably not good. But anyway, her show used to be a lot different than what it is now or whatever. But but, uh, I remember going home terrified. Now, I didn't talk to anyone about this. Nobody knew about this. I didn't have – I was young. I was – uh, how old are you in the sixth grade? Twelve. I was twelve. And uh, I didn't talk to anybody about this. I didn't have anyone to talk to. No one that I felt like I could confide in. And so I went home and I, and I started, I was terrified. And then I remember my cousin Ashley, not this one, but my cousin Robert Ashley. Um, he starts telling me a few months later about the mark of the beast. So at this point, I'm just like this. I'm just like having a mental breakdown. I'm like, the market, what is this market, the beast stuff? I was like, you know, and, and I don't want to take up too much of y'all's time. I just wanted to start at the beginning, just kind of see how it was just a roller coaster and then eventually an avalanche of, uh, of things that just, it was a culmination of things that just went, it just, it all worked out for the good. But anyway, um, so I had all this stuff and all these fears bottled up, and I went to a strict, a, a strict church. Like a, they, they were very exclusive and very legalistic, like um, to the point to where I just couldn't ask them that question. You know, I could not confide in anyone. If I would have told my pastor, who didn't even probably know my name, 
and it was a small church, um, I don't know what would have happened. And I say that to say that I think it's very important that in 2017 that kids feel safe to tell you about the struggles that they have. I will tell you, and your theology might be different, but everyone has the right to be wrong. (laughs) Not everyone who is struggling with the homosexuality identity is demon-possessed. You know, it, it's it's a behavioral thing. Not everyone who's who's in that struggle has been molested. You know, that does happen. Um, but it's only something that God can deliver you from. And it's only something that God can help you with. I'm in school right now to be a counselor. I want to counsel people. But I know that my limited secular education can only go so far. I have a burden for people who have come out of this or who want to come out of this and have no one to talk to and, and no one to, you know, because they get picked on at school. They get picked on in their families. And did you even know that they get picked on at church? Okay. Um, I have a clean mouth. I'm not potty mouth. But do you believe that there are pastors who actually say the word Q-U-E-E-R from pupit, pulpit? And you want to talk about hurt. The first time I was a grown man, I was going to a Baptist church. I was trying to turn my life around. I had went to the altar, and I had repented of my sins, and I was faithful to my vow that I made with God. I did not. I forsook that lifestyle. As a matter of fact, the pastor, that was on a Wednesday, um, on a Sunday, I got baptized, and he stopped me. I was in the middle. I was going to, to change or whatever. He said, I heard you threw out all your worldly music, all your worldly DVDs and all, or movies and all this stuff. And I was like, yes, I want to live. I want to be closer to God. And he was like, I admire you for that. And, you know, I was like, okay, I'm finally on the right path. Well, not even a year later, he's up there, and he's saying this word from the pulpit. Now, there's a better way to reach people. The Bible says you got to love people, okay? And you got to share the truth in love, okay? But there are people still to this day, and it makes me it's just, makes me have to, you know, but on that, even on the minister's forum that I'm on, that they, um, they love everyone. They want everyone to be saved except for the homosexual because it's an abomination unto the Lord and it's, but do you know what it is? It's because that makes them feel insecure about themselves. It challenges their masculinity. And believe it or not, when you're, uh, uh, when you're counseling with the homosexuality, uh, someone in homosexuality, they probably don't want to sleep with you. You need to get over that. Just counsel them. Tell them how to live right and get over yourself. That's what I want to tell some people and probably have. But... You know, for me, it was a lot. I I, I got in church, and um, like I said, I was raised Pentecostal. So I was at this Baptist church, and I was faithful. I mean, I was faithful. Uncle Ricky, he told me to start in the book of John, figure out who Jesus was. I started there, did that. I mean, I was at every service, every time the doors were open, any time there was a a revival or um, within a 100-mile radius, I was there. I mean, I was faithful. And... Honestly, I was blessed because God also gave me a desire and an attraction to women. So I was on the hunt for a wife. Um, so I, that's why I would go to all these extra services. Well, I knew. <laughs> well, it was because of God, too. You know, he had a little, he had a little bit to do with it as well. But um, uh, after about a year and a half, I became very disillusioned with that church because of the language coming from the pulpit. Because, you know, there, there's a big push from, I know this, I'm not blind or stupid or deaf. I know there's a big push from the homosexual community that says, hey, you have to accept us. You know, I get that. I know that that's there. But regardless, our answer should still be with love. Absolutely with love. Never, ever should anyone... You know what? I wish right now... Do you know what else we had right now? Because I want to test you guys out. I wish we had a gay couple in the back right now holding hands. I want to see if y'all would love them. 
I believe you would, but I want to just see. I just wish we did. I think that'd be a fun experiment. Of course, I'd be the first one to go back there and minister to him, but I would do it with love. Um, but anyway, so I became disillusioned with that, and I knew about the power of the Holy Ghost because I was raised, you know, Church of God. Um, they had a split. Then we started going to the Assembly of God, which is the same church my Uncle Rick was raised in, and my grandma was still alive at that time. And uh, I knew about the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It took me about nine months to receive the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in other tongues. Um, I had a lot of guilt, a lot of self-hatred, a, lo- a low self-esteem. Um, I didn't think I was the hot tamale that I am today. Just kidding. Just seeing if y'all are paying attention. Um, I just thought that, you know, I wasn't worth anything in the eyes of God. I, th- I had nothing to offer him. The only thing that I c- could offer God, and I've already warned y'all that I'm a crier, so... The only thing I had to offer him was my broken life. But you know what I found out? Is that to him it was a priceless treasure. And you can quote me on saying that. But I got the Holy Ghost, and I was like, yes, this is, finally I'm not going to have these feelings anymore. I'm going to be delivered from all this. This devil that's inside of me that's causing me to have these feelings, you know, it's going to go away. And guess what? Woke up the next morning, still fighting the same temptations that I had to fight the day before. But I had God. I mean, I had had the Holy Ghost. I did. And that helps. And he will help you and he will deliver you. Could be an overnight thing. But for me, it was a behavioral thing. I had to change my behaviors. I had to change the way I, the places that I went. I had to, which should be common sense. We all know that. When you're a Christian, you shouldn't do the same things that you've done. And let me say this too, because this is another one of pet peeve of mine. If you've had the Holy Ghost for 20 years and you're still in the same place that you were 20 years ago, there's a disconnect. And I promise you, I promise you it's not with the Holy Ghost. So, you need to change what you're doing. But, See, I, I was trying so hard, and, and Uncle Rick can tell you, he even talked to me about it the other night. I, was, I tried to do everything that I could, that I could, to make my life a better life. I was dressing right. I was, uh, I mean, sometimes I would, I mean, I would, if someone said, hey, you need to, I remember there was an elder, uh, Dub Smith, at the assembly of God. He said, Brother Larry, and he didn't know my struggle. I, I still wasn't very open about it. He said, Brother Larry, if you get rid of your TV, he said, you'd be able to spend more time reading your Bible, and you'd be able to be a better Christian. Now, I promise you, that TV got chunked out that same day. And uh, he was right. I had more time. You know, I had more time. I'd play worship music. I'd pray and, you know, just, just in my little apartment. And he started showing me things, and he did. Brother Dub Smith was right about that. Um, I'm not preaching against TV. I have two. Okay, I'm not preaching against that, but I'm just saying that uh, he knew, I don't know if it was from the Lord or whatever, he just said, if you would get rid of that TV, maybe God knew that I needed that for that season in my life. But like I said, I was trying to do everything that I could do, not what God could do. I want y'all to catch on to that. I wasn't relying on the Lord at this point. I was relying on myself because I had to. All my life, I had to fend for myself. Not in the sense my parents were good parents. I never went hungry, never had, I always had nice clothes. I always got to do the hobbies that I wanted to do, nothing like that. But when it came to my identity, it was all on me. I had no one I could talk to. I had to do what I could do. And so this led to this just, it was like a pressure cooker, you know. And I was just, I was sinking and I knew it. And you know what I thought the answer was? I thought legalism was the answer. Uncle Ricky can testify to that. I thought being one of those hard-nosed Christians was, well, I can't believe she, you know, wore that. Or, you know, I can't believe that they're doing this and the pastor hadn't caught on to it yet. If he would just ask me, I'd straighten out this whole place. I don't know if y'all know anybody like that, but I used to to be that guy. But... um, it was just, I was self-imploding. You know, I, I just wasn't relying on God. I wasn't relying on the Holy I had the Holy Ghost. Um, but I wasn't relying on God 
to, to help me with this problem. So eventually, sadly, and I remember the day that it happened, um, I walked out of a youth meeting because at that time I was still considered youth. Um, at that time I had switched churches again. Um, and love, I mean, that church I fell in love with, it was just where I belonged. Those people loved me. They accepted me. I even got to tell a few of them about my struggle, and they loved me anyway. And I thought, whoop, I found a place where I belong. But it still was like this pressure cooker of self-loathing and self-hatred. And, you know, I never, never, ever, ever, ever had the thought of taking my life or I knew that I would serve God one day. I can't explain it. I was, a, I was a hot mess, hot mess inside. But I knew that God could do something with me if I would just hold on. But I wasn't holding on the right way. And that will sink in with you in a, right, in a little bit. But I remember the night that I left the church. We had had a youth service on a Friday night. And it was a barbecue. We had hot dogs, and they burnt them, and I didn't like them. And I remember thinking, I'm leaving I left and I went to the bar. Now, this started a new chapter in my life. Last time I went to that church, um, I would go back every now and again and visit, but I started bar hopping, started working in bars. I worked in a bar, um, worked in a lesbian bar. Um, they don't tip well in a lesbian bars if you're a guy. I just want you to know that. <laughs> But, nevertheless, I was in a mess, guys. I was in a, a total mess financially. I decided to go back to school at that point. I do graduate in May. Uh, it's been a long time coming. 1806, Reynolds Road, Perigold, Arkansas, 724. I'm just I, I really am just kidding. But, uh, you know, I, I found myself in a mess. I was working in a, in a lesbian sports bar, and it just... I just was overwhelmed. I was like, Lord, please, please, please just do something. And guess what happened? I found a church that was accepting of homosexuals. Where, what better place could I be, you know? And they were. But I went two times, and it was just, it was awful. It was more about politics than it was anything else. I mean, they just were weird. They were just some of the weirdest people that I'd ever met. And so that didn't last long. That was in Memphis, Tennessee. So anyway, fast forward a few years. I'm still out of church. My mom gets sick. This is a turning point for me because I, I was a mama's boy. I loved my mom. I had moved off to Russellville to go to college. Um, still not in church. Doing well in college. But then I get the phone call. My dad's on the other line of the bawling. He said, son, you need to come home. He said, your mom's not going to make it through the weekend. And I just remember dropping the phone and having to sit down because I was lightheaded and I was like, I don't know what's going on right now. That was the night Uncle Ricky met me at the hospital. And I told him that it was my fault that my mom was dying because I was backslidden and that I was gay and God was unhappy with me and you know, he assured me that's not how God works. And Anyway, we spent the next three months. She wasn't supposed to make it through the weekend, but we, we spent the next three months uh, with her, taking care of her as much as we could. At that point, I had tried to dedicate my life back to God, and uh, it was more out of, of fear and desperation than anything else. And repentance that is born in a storm will not survive in the calm. Let that sink in. You have to be sincere when you repent. You can't just have a crisis. My brother is the world's worst. He never repents until he gets arrested. And then all of a sudden he wants to turn his life to God. But as soon as he gets out of jail, he's right back. But I mean... I'm believing that that curse is going to be broken because I have the faith to believe it. He's just got to get it in his mind and in his heart. So my mom passed away, 
It was very hurtful. I still went to church for a few more weeks after that, and then finally I just gave up, and I said, God hates me. I said, he just hates me. I said, he won't. I said, I'll, I'll try to get close to him. I'll pray through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But then it's like, it's like the story in the Bible where um, the man had seven more demons come back to him that were stronger than the first that left. It was kind of like that. It was like every time I would um, try to do better, it's just like things would just come at me that were just seven times worse. And I just couldn't, I didn't have the equipment I didn't have that spiritual armor. I didn't, I wasn't digging in the word. I wasn't, I thought just having the Holy Ghost and going to church wasn't enough. I wasn't digging in the word. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, seeking godly fellowship. I, I wasn't seeking um, the things I needed to do. I was visiting places at night I shouldn't have been and, and all of that. And then one day I'm in nursing school. I'd gotten accepted into the nursing program at Arkansas Tech University and I started having a lot of health issues, like with my heart. So I thought, God, I'm going to die, and I'm going to go to hell, and there's nothing that can be done about it. And I had people who were telling me, you know what, God, you were born that way. It's okay, and, you know, you're going to be fine. You love the Lord, and he sees your heart and all this. If anyone ever tells you that they were born that way, you look them in the eye, and you say, that's why Jesus said you must be born again. Okay? Because they're going to have 10,000 arguments and all of this so-called scientific proof and all this baloney, and you just tell them that's why Jesus said you must be born again. And um, they're going to give you every excuse in the world, and you just have to tell the truth in... Okay. So, all the while... My pastor at the UPC in Truman and his wife would randomly send me texts. We love you. We miss you. We're praying for you. I remember getting a text on Memorial Day. It was actually the Memorial, Memorial Day before I gave, before I got back into church officially, like forever, which is where I am now. Uh, it was the Memorial, Memorial Day before that happened, which was in April. And she randomly, it was, it had been like a year since I talked to her, and she said, I don't, I'm just thinking of you today, and I just want you to know that I love you, and that no matter what you're doing or where you are, you always welcome here. And they knew what I, I mean, at that point, they, they knew, because I was pretty, pretty out there. And uh, I remember bawling. I was somewhere I shouldn't have been, and I just remember leaving early, because I couldn't, I was, I was just bawled. And so that was kind of like, then there's nursing school and all this. Oh, it just started just all mounting up all this pressure. My heart was hurting. My blood pressure was out of control. I thought I was dying. And finally, one night, it was the week before Easter in April of 2014, I hit my knees at the end of my bed, and I said, God, I said, I don't know what to do. I said, I have tried to live for you with everything that I know to do. I said, I have been baptized with the Holy Ghost. I said, I have read your word and all this. And then he said, if you will just come to me and let me hold you and let me help you, I will bring you out of this. I've got so much in store for you. He told me, he said, I miss you. Has anyone ever had God tell him that he misses him? I'm telling you, that was, he told me he missed me. That's why I'm his favorite. But, <laughs> but uh, ever since then, I've been on the straight and narrow, literally. And God has helped me, and he's delivered me, and he's brought me to the place where I am today. And he, you know, I'll say this. I used to stay frustrated because... I was like, okay, Lord, I want, I'm living for you. This is back when I was in church before. I was like, I, if I'm going to be successful in this, I knew I had a call of God on my life. I knew that. I said, Lord, but I'm going to need you to bring someone into my life to help me through this. And he, and he did. And I had a list of things. I had a list. And I want you to know that this girl meet, met all the criteria. God, what he does, he does great. 
And I'm here to tell you that he, is set, he will set the homosexual free. Those who have been sexually abused, I've never had to walk in those shoes, but I guarantee you I could help them. I could counsel with them. I could love them. I, could, I don't know the answer to their questions, but I love them. And I can help them learn scripture. And I can help them pray. And I can help them. And that's what we're all supposed to do. Our identity in Christ is to be the arms and the feet of Jesus. Okay, so now we're going to go to a few scriptures. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Okay. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not of your own? You were bought with a price. Okay, when Jesus was nailed to that cross... And they jabbed that spear. I mean, that, that, was, that was a price that none of us could pay. And he was sinless and he was spotless. And every, I want you to think about this. Every sin, he became sin. He was touched with the feeling of our infirmity. So, like, guess what? He knew how little Larry Vinson felt in the sixth grade the first time he ever heard Oprah Winfrey say that he was going to hell because he was gay. He knew how I felt, but I never realized that. I never realized who I was in God. But you are the body in the temple of the Holy Ghost, and you should act like it at all times. And don't get me wrong, it's hard, but you can do it. Acts 1 and 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So one of the main reasons God gave us the Holy Ghost is to be... Are you witnessing? I'm going to ask you some some questions here, just to get you thinking, not because I'm trying to be mean. How many people in here, and I want you to raise your hands, how many people in here know at least one homosexual? How many people in here go out of their way to let them know that they love them? That's beautiful. I commend you guys for that because you won't find that in every church. I commend you guys for that. Um, Man, that's beautiful. I didn't expect that. I'm not going to lie to you. That, 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 that floored me. That, that's great. I, that's beautiful. So, we all, man, that threw me off. I'm telling you, that just, that just floored me because you just, you don't know some of the things ministers see or go through or hear or, or how we ought to act. And, you know, you know, there's always someone above us telling us how we ought to act and what we can accept and what we can't. And, but I'm so thankful for you guys. And you guys just keep reaching because you can make the difference in their life. I have a friend, her name is Emily Whittingham. I've talked to my wife about her many times. She's from the Truman United Pentecostal Church, and we were, we were good friends, good friends. And when I left that church, it broke her heart. And she knew why I left. But she never gave up on me. And she never quit telling me, I love you. Now, I knew she didn't agree with my lifestyle. But she would invite, hey, do you want to come eat with us? Do you want to come to church and come eat with us afterwards, you know? Oh, no, I'd feel awkward. No, everybody loves you. You don't have to be. And I believe that. And they loved me back to Jesus. They loved me back to Jesus. And it was through that that I found the power. I found the grace that I needed to, to, to finally overcome that. And now I know why I went through it. I don't think God intentionally wants us to go through things. Uh, uh, that might not be the way I want to say it. But I know we go through things so we can help other people. And I know one of the, one of the reasons that I, I will now be able to help other people through this addiction or, or through this uh, behavioral problem or through this identity crisis that they're having is because I've actually been there. I can, I can actually say, hey, you can overcome this. You know, I can help you. Let me just help you. Let me be your friend. You know, of course, I have... Ministerial ethics, I have to do. My wife has to be present and all that because, 
it would be dangerous. When you're a drunk, you don't go into the bar witnessing. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I, there's, there's things that God's training us, getting us ready for, you know, in the ministry. And I believe that the homosexual community is one of the greatest mission fields out there. And listen, they're in your face. I know that. But please don't get mad at them. Because I, I promise you, when they lay down at, sl- at night to sleep, they know that they're all by themselves. They can claim, do you know, there are Pentecostal affirming churches. And it is the most, I mean, Ichabod is just written on the, that door. I've been there. Um, I didn't know if y'all knew that. There are, uh, for instance, there's uh, the Global Alliance of Apostolic Pentecostals. And it is just like the United Pentecostal Church, except for they believe that it's okay to be gay. So they believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost and all that, which is just, I can't even, I'm not even going to put my judgment on that because that God's a lot more merciful than I am. But I know, but if you guys just keep loving these people and keep trying to reach out to them and keep trying to give them what you've got and you just keep showing them that you're consistently loving them, not just, oh, come to church. There's a difference in witnessing and there's a difference in uh, asking someone to come to church. Now, I'm not here to beat anyone up, but just these people that you know, all you that raise your hands, you just love those people. Talk about the Lord in front of them, but don't make them feel... I mean, yes, you have to tell them the truth. You have an obligation to tell them the truth, but you do it with love. You don't do it in a harsh way. You don't do it in a mean way. You do it with love, and it's very hard. I used to be one of those, and I still have... The struggle's real. You know, you meet the people who are in your face, you know, about it. And it makes you just want to get in their face. But you don't because you want to love them. You want to show the love of God. So um, this is my favorite one about our identity in Jesus. Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. I truly believe in order for you to heal, you have to tell people what you went through. That's what I'm up here doing tonight. My pastor, when I first told him that I wanted to share my experience, he looked at me like I was crazy. Because I go to a church of 350 Pentecostal believers. And he was like, you're opening yourself up for, you're making yourself really vulnerable. He didn't. He didn't discourage me from it, but he just said, I want you to understand. You know, people don't look at you the same way, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I have been blessed because I am able to talk to my congregation and they love me and they love my wife and they know that we're as legitimate as we can be about things. And my pastor, he just, not that, I don't want any accolades or anything, but he just, every time he announces when I'm going to preach, he says, I just wish I had the boldness that Brother Larry Vincent has because he opens himself up not knowing how anyone's going to react, but he does it anyway in the fear of the Lord, wanting to help people. And that is a great compliment, and I appreciate that. But I love that we're made overcomers by the word of our testimony. So if you have a testimony, I don't care what it's about. It could be about a a, a broken finger. If the Lord healed it, don't ever get tired of telling it. Because someone out there has a broken finger and they need to know the Lord can heal it. So, um, man invented the sin system, by the way. You know, we, we talk about this sin and that sin and that sin, but we ignore. Uh, all, to God, it all stinks. So, we need to treat it as such. You know, sin is sin. Now, for my last verse, and in closing, I will say, Colossians 2 and 10. And ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. We are complete in Jesus. Our identity is complete in Him. When you have Jesus in your life, you've got everything you need. When you got that Holy Bible out and you're on your knees, you've got everything you need to beat the devil. When you are praying and you pray in the name of Jesus, you take, you you know what you do? You take, that situation, 
and you transfer it in the name of Jesus. So guess what? Now it's Jesus' problem. Not that it's a problem for Jesus because he can do anything. But let's say, Uncle Rick, let's say, uh, I don't want to speak anything negative over you, but let's just say you have a problem. And I'm praying for you, and I say, and I put my hand on you and say, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you be healed, blah, blah. Guess what? It's no longer anything. I'm doing what the Scripture told me to do. But it's, it's up to Jesus now. And it's the same way with this, this epidemic. And how many of y'all know that the homosexuality thing is an epidemic? I mean, people can choose what sexuality they want to identify with. My wife, I don't keep up with it because it's just a bad reminder of my past, but she was telling me there is now a third gender. Like uh, there's the uh, male, female, uh, the pansexual, the homosexual, all that, but it's something else. It's called like the third identity or something like that and it's basically it's just really weird I, I couldn't understand it it was so weird i was like it's too complicated i'm sure there's a bathroom for it but i don't care so but it just you know it just uh it was just weird and it's just going to get more and more weird because we are seeing that day approach and that's why i encourage you guys and i'm about to pass this off to your pastor to end, for the altar service but I encourage you guys, and, and like, again, you shocked me with all of you who raised your hands that you love the homosexual, not the sin. You know, we say love the sinner and hate the sin, but it's so hard to separate it sometimes. And sometimes we feel like we're separating it, but we're really not. So you got to pray for wisdom in those situations. But I just encourage you to keep reaching out because, you know what? When you get to heaven, like I told y'all this morning, I think about Judgment Day a lot. When you get to heaven and, and God says, Larry Vinson, you helped this person realize their potential in me, and now I get to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and they're going to enter into the joy of the Lord. How good is that going to make me feel? On the flip side of that, Let's say I'm one of these preachers up here dropping the F-bomb and everything else from the pulpit and hurting people and all that, and they never come back to church. Um, and the Lord says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, and it's my fault. How much more of the worst am I going to feel? It's going to be terrible. So I pray always that I treat everybody with love and respect. And if I've ever done anything, my wife will tell you this, even if I know I haven't done anything, I'll go to someone and I'll say, hey, have I offended you? Because you haven't talked to me in about four or five days. So I just want to make sure we're good. Um, I just do that. That's just me. I can't help it. I'm OCD. But um, I just encourage you to just keep reaching out, just keep loving these people because they want to be loved. They act like they don't want your love. They act like they don't want your acceptance. But I promise you, when they lay down tonight to go to sleep, they, they can't sleep because they know, they feel that guilt, they feel that burden, you know. And they know it's just them and God and that they need to make themselves right with the Lord. So I'm so glad that I was able to do that and that God never took me home or took me to the, wherever I was going to go before I was able to become complete in Him. Well, God's grace is sufficient, isn't it? The challenge of the 2017, Larry laid it out there for us. And so, all of us, all of us have challenges. And it may not be being gay, it could be something else. The teenagers, you guys that are here, you young ladies that are here, with you face it at school, you hear it talked about, you hear it being made fun of, we've all been there. But I can tell you in the, in the years when Larry when first learned that this was an issue with him, and I think he can attest to this, 
He was never rejected by our family that I know of. Never. Rejection never wins anything. Rejection never wins anything. There has to be genuine love and genuine concern and genuine care. And I promise you, these homosexual people that you know, they hear you. They hear your criticism or they hear your instruction for righteousness and the attitude that it's done in. It's a great challenge for the church. It's a great challenge. Now, I'm going to ask you tonight, how many